All right, so this is the fir third recording in the genetics and learning um, lectures. And so what we're going to do this time is look at both genes and the environment working together. And there's some uh, different studies that we want to talk about and uh, explain kind of what's going on. So we're going to start with inprinting. Um, this is uh, a behavior that uh, is usually associated with ducks, but uh, uh, lots of animals will do this. And there's a couple of different types. And then we're going to do some cross fostering where you have uh, some adoptee parents. And then we're going to uh, do one on spatial learning just to kind of give you a uh, different versions of what could happen. So we'll start with the imprinting. And um, again, um, Lorenz is the one that's known for this uh, in 1935. And you can see the little uh, uh, gooselings that are following him. And on the right is a uh, Canadian geese and mom and the, and the little uh, little ducks. And so what happens with, with ducks, they're kind of in their brain when they're born, um, they will imprint. And what they imprint on is really what they see at first. Uh, so, how, you know, um, are you my mommy? How do you figure that out? Uh, what Lorenz found out is it's not an immediate, hey, I know you're my mother. Um, there is a, what he called a sensitive period. And that sensitive period was the time it took that bird to kind of figure out, hey, you are my mom and I want to start following you. And so this makes sense because when a, when a, when a baby duck hatches or a goose hatches, it's typically, what are you going to see the most? It's going to be mom. Uh, what he did is he had them imprint on him. And actually, if you see here, he's wearing these rubber boots. Uh, and the ducks actually associate to those boots. And that's what we did at the LA Zoo. We had an Egyptian goose and we wanted to train it to follow us. And everybody wore uh, those um, boots. And so uh, it was something that they would uh, uh, follow. And we did a really good job. And the goose would follow us around, uh, walking around behind us. Uh, <laughs> and we screwed up. And actually there's a sensitive period where they um, are getting used to it. And then there's a critical period where it really kind of in locks. And this is where we screwed up at the zoo. What happened was we had got another bird in called a trumpeter. And it's uh, a bird from South America and it kind of looks chicken-like. Um, but what we ended up doing and not thinking about it is once it came out of quarantine, we put it in the cage next to the uh, Egyptian goose. Uh, so instead of following us, uh, it followed uh, the trumpeter. Uh, uh, during that critical period, that animal looked more like, you know, what, what it probably mom would look like. And so we had a shift. Um, and so we ended up uh, changing what we were training. Uh, instead of having follow us, we, we ended up having it run after the trumpeter, which worked out well. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, live and learn. Okay, so. Uh, the other one we want to talk about in printing is sexual imprinting. It, you know, and it, um, it happens uh, a, a lot longer than filial. Uh, the hormones have to kick in. Uh, this is actually a California condor. And uh, it is showing one of the behaviors it does to uh, uh, attract a female. And we, we, it's funny, California condors, I don't know how much you know about them. Uh, they are... Uh, one of the most endangered animals on the planet. Uh, they were actually down to just uh, 23 birds remaining in the world and they were all caught up and they were at the LA Zoo and San Diego Wild Animal Park and now uh, there's also a breeding facility up in uh, Idaho. Uh, they got them separated in case you know some catastrophe happened, earthquake, fire, we want to make sure we didn't lose them all. Well that number is now way up. We have them back out in the wild uh, but uh, what I wanted to talk about is the sexual imprinting. Uh, so what they do is they kind of learn uh, what a partner looks like and what a partner will do. Uh, well, we had a bird at the LA Zoo called Topa Topa. And Topa Topa was, um, he had fallen out of a nest years and years and years ago. And before they were that endangered. And the LA Zoo took him in and put him in a cage and pretty much left him alone. I mean, there was no other partner for him. No zoos were breeding him. No birds, no, no zoos were really even looking at condors as an, uh, an exhibit. You know, if you look at them, they're not the, the prettiest birds in the world. Um, so 
Uh, this bird was in captivity by itself for, for, for a very long time. Uh, but then all of a sudden when the condors went down, it was important to get this bird in the population. Uh, uh, what was exciting was um, Topa Topa was genetically different than everybody else that was out here. His line uh, died out. So he had genes that no other bird had. So it was important to get um, him involved. Well, the problem was uh, Topa Topa was loving the keepers. Uh, and so what would happen is when a, a keeper would go in during uh, breeding season, you know, his wings would pop out like that and he would look big and, and rock back and forth because he was excited. Uh, well, with the condor project, they, they decided let's give him a female, you know, he'll, he'll be excited. Well, he didn't care. He didn't like the female. He didn't know what the female was uh, and he would kind of bully her. Uh, and so they're trying to figure out, well, we need him to breed. Uh, so how do we how do we get him to um, figure out that uh, his partner uh, is the female? Uh, so what they ended up doing was putting the female in there, and then they had the keeper walk in behind the female, and so he was looking across the female at uh, the keeper, and all of a sudden, you know, wings go out and he starts rocking back and forth. Well, the female sees it and she knows what that means. So she kind of goes over and starts picking on his feathers and whatever. And all of a sudden he's like, hey, this is kind of nice. So uh, it took a little bit, but he finally figured out uh, what he was supposed to do. And uh, he now has, he's a proud father and his genes are represented. The other way to go would have been artificial insemination. Uh, but if you can get him to breed, it would, it's so much easier. Um, some other, a couple other uh, uh, studies I want you to know is cross fostering. Uh, these are two local birds. Uh, the one up on the top uh, is a great egret, and the one on the bottom is a, uh, a great blue heron. And both of these are found here. Both of these have been seen in our wildlife sanctuary. And they both are very similar. They eat fish. Uh, but what you'll find out is kind of the size of the fish differ. Uh, typically, the great egret eats a smaller fish, and the great blue herons uh, eat a larger fish. So what they thought is, let's do a study, mock thought, um, and what we'll do is uh, they'll lay eggs, and we will take the eggs out and put them in with the other um, uh, uh, bird and see what happens. Now, what you need to know is great egrets have a tendency to kill siblings. It is very common to see. Great blue herons, on the other hand, rarely kill their, their siblings. So what they thought is, let's see what happens. Uh, by flipping them, what they found out is the great blue herons weren't getting enough food. Uh, the smaller food wasn't ac uh, adequate. And so they started killing their siblings. Um, so uh, the environmental situation that they found themselves in uh, altered the typical behavior. Whereas the egrets, when they were given in, in the blue heron's nest and given larger food, uh, it turned out they still killed their siblings. They did not change the behavior, even though they probably were getting enough food. Um, so uh, there are some genes involved and it affected one of the birds, but not the other, which was rather interesting. Uh, the next one is the black cat chickadee. Uh, it is a bird around here. It's more of a mountain bird. Uh, we don't typically see it um, locally this low, although it can come down here. Uh, but anyway, so what you see is these guys will stash food and they'll check for food. Well, not so much stash, but uh, check for food. And you notice they're all related. They're all genetically related. But uh, the birds in Alaska will only do uh, two inspections, uh, where the Colorado birds will do almost eight inspections. And the reason we think it is, it's all environmental. Uh, spatial learning. Where, where were things left? Uh, in Alaska, uh, you're under more extreme conditions. And so you don't have the luxury of continuing to check. Uh, whereas in Colorado, where it's a little bit milder, uh, you do have the luxury of going ahead, maybe doing more inspections. But yeah, Alaska is such a severe conditions compared to Colorado. Again, they're both kind of snowy conditions. Um, uh, <coughs> but the conditions of the environment really kind of affect the behavior of them uh, looking uh, for cash food. And then just to take this to the human component, um, genetic differences in, in adoption. Um, 
and spatial ability, the, the ability to uh, uh, remember where things are. And so test scores, what they found out if, um, now you kind of have to uh, kind of read this and we've got uh, together. Uh, so together means with their um, parent and genetically related, adopted apart um, means that uh, they are uh, adopted, but they are not, um, not mixed. So you had MZ is a, um, identical twins and DZ is fraternal twins. And so what we're going to look at is uh, how, how things relate to each other. So let's start with the PO, the parent and offspring. Uh, so if you look at PO and they're together, uh, the spatial correlation is about 33%. Um, if they're uh, adopted and the kids are not with the parents, the, the ratio is only 24%. And then if they're just adoptive and, and it is only 0 0.02. Um, so there is very low correlation. So what this is basically saying, if you, if you look at this, uh, is that there is a genetic component to it. Um, and you can tell that because of the 33 and 24. Um, and um, but there is some also environmental because there's 24, if there wasn't environmental, it would be up to 33. All right, so then let's look at twins. Now, the idea is twins are genetically the same. Now, um, I want to make sure you understand identical twins are identical. It means that a single egg was fertilized, that egg split into two, and now you have two individuals. So their genetics are pretty much, unless there's some mutation or change, the same. Uh, fraternal twins, on the other uh, hand, are um, not any closer than brother and sister. And so here you can see uh, when they're comparing uh, kids adopted apart, um, uh, the identical twins had a 0.49, uh, which makes sense because they're closely related. Um, when they were together, you can see it's all the way up to 62%. Again, so the genes and the environment are exactly the same. Uh, and now when you see fraternal twins uh, together, they're at 0.34, which is what you would expect because of the genetics and the environment together. It's very close to the 33%. Uh, so what this is saying is, is, just to make sure we understand it, is spatial ability in humans has a genetic component, but also has a um, environmental component. And so we are very similar to other animals in that respect. And that will end the recording.